Hello, my name is Commander Andrea Cameron and welcome to this virtual conference about human security in the maritime environment. This conference explores the human security concept as applied to the strategic maritime environment. We have a specific focus on its implications for the roles, missions, and capabilities of navies and coast guards. I am Commander Andrea Cameron, a permanent military professor at the U.S. Naval War College. Here, I teach foreign policy analysis and electives on climate change and national security. I'm also the director of the Climate and Human Security Group. It's in this role that we conceptualize the conference and many members of the group work together to establish a framework for our talks today and identify some of the best speakers from around the world on these subjects. During this event, we seek to expand the concept of human security into the maritime environment to initiate proactive strategic thought on these issues. We have set up five panels throughout the event. We previously had panels on human security in the maritime environment and coastal zones, criminal activities in the maritime environment, and illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing. Next, we discuss unsafe mixed migration and modern slavery and the protection of cultural heritage. Within each topic, we ask the panels to cover a series of questions. One, what is the human security issue? Two, what does it mean for the maritime strategic environment? Three, what does it mean for navies and coast guards? And four, what are our operational policy and force options? Joining us today are scholars and members from militaries all around the world. We have representatives from over 30 different countries, primarily staying connected through the Naval War College Alumni Program. Part of our continuing education mission is to keep learning together as a community, and we're thrilled to have such a broad audience today. The conference program can be found at the bottom of the events page. It has the agenda and the biography for all the participants. The event is being recorded and the majority of it will be available on the Naval War College YouTube page after the event. Now, before we proceed, I have to thank my conference co-organizer, and the Captain Jerome E. Levy Chair of Economic Geography, Dr. Chris Jaspero, as well as the Naval War College Foundation for sponsoring the conference. It is through their generosity that today's event is made possible. And at this point, I'll briefly introduce my colleague, Dr. Chris Jaspero, for a few comments. Dr. Jaspero is a formal Naval officer. He's currently serving as a professor at the Naval War College and as the Jerome Levy Levy Chair of Geography. He is a geographer and field archaeologist with over 25 years of experience specializing in environmental security, cultural heritage protection, and African and Asian regional geography and transnational security issues. Dr. Jaspero, I look forward to hearing your thoughts today. Good morning. Thank you, Andrea. And uh, for everybody who's on, thank you for being here, especially those who we've dragged back for a second day in a row and um, people who have joined us today. I was uh, happy when Andrea came to me with the concept and proposal for this conference because it, it fills the remit of the Levy chair in a number of ways. The, the primary purpose of the chair is to uh, promote understanding of the relationships between economic geography and national security and human security issues in the maritime domain are inherently both economic and geographic. Uh, geographers and economic geographers are particularly concerned with looking at human environmental interactions as well as the distribution of people and their activities across space and scale. Um, in this case, economic ones. And as we've seen from our presentation so far, I think almost everyone has dealt with some type of human environmental interplay. Um, and we've looked at problems and how they span uh, everything from individuals and local communities up to global, global processes and how these things cross space, whether it's people or illicit goods or um, other types of trafficking. Uh, secondly, there's a theme that many of the 
speakers have brought up, which I think is a is very important, and that's the the interactions between human security and national security, and looking at how they reinforce each other and are not necessarily not necessarily separate phenomena. And I think this is an important corrective, particularly um, for naval thinking in the United States, where we tend to take a dualistic view of security and pose oppositions such as traditional, non-traditional, irregular, regular, human security and national security. And uh, this poses a threat on a number of levels. First, you know, in preparing for the big sea fight, um, it's important not to die a death of a thousand cuts as human insecurity erodes our uh, social structures or economies, uh, the legitimacy of our institutions. Also, our adversaries fight across these spaces and are not making a distinction between things on the human security end and the national security end. So our strategic adversaries we see exploiting human insecurities in, in order to gain control of the human terrain in littoral and oceanic regions um, in attempts to either win without fighting or have a better geostrategic position if there is a fight. So no use again preparing for the big fight if, if we lose before the shots go up. And then also as we've learned in recent uh, terrestrial conflicts, it's one thing to prevail in major combat operations. It's another thing to not be able to handle the human security issues in the after aftermath, which um, are needed to prevail long term. So hopefully, uh, the type of thinking we're seeing in this conference will will help us from having to relearn that lesson uh, someday in the maritime domain. And lastly, you know, we've looked at a lot of negative negative news and depressing topics, but it's it's a good reminder to uh, realize that one of the reasons we're having these conversations is because many of the issues we're talking about uh, as challenges are things that, you know, back in the 16th century were acceptable ways for states to wage warfare with through state uh, sponsored piracy seizing and exploiting the resources of, of other states, uh, dispossessing people and engaging in state-sponsored human trafficking to uh, serve economies. So in the long term, you know, the fact that these challenges still exist is a problem. But on the other hand, the fact that we're talking about them in a way that's different than our predecessors a few centuries ago is a, is a sign of progress. And lastly, I know everybody's probably sick of being on Zoom and uh, COVID world, but uh, pre-COVID, you know, we would have had to do this in person, and um, many of us would not be able to have attended because of reasons of time, space, or travel. So, uh, despite the challenges of COVID, there there are also some some opportunities, and uh, so I'm happy you're able to join us and uh, take part in this conference. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Jaspero. We appreciate your comments today. Now, yesterday I had the honor of introducing my commander, Rear Admiral Shoshana Chatfield, the president of the Naval War College. But to add to my earlier bio, I'm also detailed to the Office of the Sec Undersecretary of Defense for Policy in the Stability and Humanitarian Affairs Office as a Climate and Environment Policy Advisor. So today I have the honor of introducing the leader in my other role, Ms. Michelle Strzok as our keynote speaker. Michelle Strzok, Principal Director for Stability and Humanitarian Affairs in the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Policy, is responsible for humanitarian assistance and disaster response policy. This includes COVID-19 global response, DOD support to the security of US embassies, peacekeeping and stability operations, and international humanitarian law, rule of law, and protection of human rights. Ms. Strzok is an expert on human rights, humanitarian affairs, and development issues in the intersection with conflict. She's previously served with Oxfam America, Islamic Relief USA, was an Arabic media analyst for CENTCOM as well. 
She holds a Master's of Arts degree in International Human Rights Law from the American University in Cairo, Egypt, and a Bachelor of Arts degree in Sociology from Ithaca College. She was also a State Department Benjamin A. Gilman Scholar for study abroad in Egypt. Ms. Strzok, we are honored to have you join us today as our keynote speaker, and I invite you to share your remarks with us. Thank you so much, and thank you to Rear Admiral Chatfield, Commander Andrea Cameron, and Professor Chris Jasparo at the Naval War College for putting together this very important conference. And of course, thank you to Andrea for your contributions to Shah. Yesterday was an essential start to this conference, highlighting the overall instability in the maritime environment, criminal activities, and illegal, unauthorized, and unrestricted fishing. Today, I am honored to be the keynote speaker for the upcoming panels on unsafe mixed migration and modern slavery and cultural heritage protection. In my position leading the Office of Stability and Humanitarian Affairs, I oversee policy related to the areas that Andrea mentioned, peacekeeping and stabilization, humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, embassy security, international humanitarian policy, including the rule of law and women, peace and security, cultural heritage protection and environmental security. This gives me a unique vantage point from which to view national security through a lens that takes into account the many underlying factors that contribute to insecurity, fragility, and conflict. Some see these areas as less traditional elements of national security. I believe that the concept of human security is a useful framework to help us better understand how conflict happens, how it can be prevented, and ultimately the range of foreign policy tools that we collectively have to respond. President Biden's letter issuing his interim national security guidance is clear. The U.S. will approach national security from a position of strength, and one of our greatest strengths as a nation is our unmatched network of allies and partners around the world. We aim to renew the strength of those alliances. In the maritime environment in which the vast seas connect us to one another, provide for us and sustain us, international cooperation is essential. A core part of our interim national security guidance is that democracy holds the key to freedom, prosperity, peace, and dignity. As we witness norms, alliances, and agreements that form the bedrock of our international order being tested, we are guided by our values and our interests as we work to protect that order. We're ensuring our national security by defending and nurturing the underlying strength of our values, our people, and our partnerships. And there are many from the world joining us today and your partnership is one of our great strengths. The challenges that threaten our collective interests, including climate change and the COVID-19 pandemic, can only be met by acting together. And as we do so, we focus not only on our partnerships with governments, but on the ways that the American people contribute to the greater security of our world and to the people of our partner nations. I'd love to tell you a little bit more about why I find human security as a concept so useful. If we focus solely on traditional external threats and physical violence, we run the risk of mistaking the symptoms for the underlying disease. The root causes underlying conflict and insecurity are complex and do not fit into the neat functional silos that we often organize ourselves around. Economic instability and poverty, food insecurity, lack of the ability to provide for a livelihood and the ability to provide for one's family, gender-based violence, inequality, and violations of fundamental human rights. These are some of the reasons that we hear for why people may choose to flee the places that they love and their homes or that exacerbate and fuel conflict. Focusing on the human security concept broadens our aperture to consider the interconnectedness of these underlying reasons. It calls on us to consider human dignity, including freedom from fear, freedom from want, and how these relate to whether people feel secure enough to be stable. Human security aligns with this point from the interim national security guidance. People are secure when they have their physical security protected, enjoy a livelihood and have their dignity protected through respect for human rights. Without one of these pillars, people are not truly secure. And while we focus on national security, we see examples all around the world where groups of people lack that basic human security, which can percolate into broader national security and international security challenges. By viewing security through this lens, we see value in addressing many of the varied types of stability that we uh, encounter that are confronted by my office. 
Human security concept is being used by militaries around the world to re-examine the insecurity of people, especially when people are caught up in the middle of the dire circumstances of conflict. This is incredible work, and I can point to the Army's Peacekeeping and Stability Operations Institute, which published a paper on this a few months ago. Land forces are considering the term human security through a variety of paradigms routinely used to address how to improve protection for civilians during military operations. These paradigms have included topics including civilian casualty mitigation, the protection of civilians, and mass atrocity response operations, as well as cross-cutting thematic topics such as children in armed conflict, conflict-related sexual violence, and sexual exploitation and abuse. This is important progress in how we think about security. While many continue to embrace human security, few have asked how people at sea or transiting across the sea can also experience human insecurity. Coastal communities and the pressures and insecurities they face on land have an important role to play in security in the maritime environment. When they face food insecurity, negative impacts of climate change, destabilizing violence, or threats to their families, livelihoods, and human rights, this can exacerbate and drive instability that plays out at sea. With so many navies around the world confronting human security issues at sea, we need conferences like this to explore these topics and our role in enhancing stability. What do we need to ask our navies and coast guards to be aware of, and how should we start planning accordingly? These are such important questions to ask, and I commend the Naval War College for bringing representatives from navies around the world, together with exceptional scholars, to discuss these topics. Moving to today, we have two more wonderful panels in this conference, and I'd like to take the opportunity to set the stage for these talks. First, I'll speak a little bit about unsafe mixed migration and modern slavery, two incredibly important topics of our time. Mixed migration in general refers to the people who are moving along routes for a variety of reasons. Some may be migrating for social or economic reasons, while others are fleeing political persecution or violence. This migration can also include trafficked persons and unaccompanied children, whether trafficked or not. Some migration is voluntary, while others are being forced to move. Migrants, refugees, and asylum seekers may all be mixed together. They have different vulnerabilities, different legal statuses. Because the volume of people who transit along the same paths, the, vol the problem can be very complex for those who are called to assist them. And this type of migration can become particularly unsafe based on overcrowding and conditions once people take to sea. This is a global phenomenon. In 1990, it is estimated that more than 150 million people migrated annually. This trend has increased every year with 221 million in 2010, 248 million in 2015, and 280 million in 2020. The constant and increasing movement of people diminishes home country populations, presents dangers for them throughout the transit and challenges host countries. According to the International Organization for Migration's Missing Migrants Project, almost 45,000 migrants have died during transit since 2014, about half of them on the central Mediterranean route between North Africa and Europe. And Europe, as we've all seen, is facing the largest migration since World War II. Traveling across water makes migrants even more vulnerable. Most boats are being, being used are substandard and ill-prepared to manage harsh sea states and are susceptible to capsize. Boats can be overcrowded to the point of asphyxi asphyxiating their occupants and are rarely provisioned to support the large number of passengers for the length of their journeys. These situations are not just unsafe, but can lead to unique small-scale humanitarian crises one boat at a time. And of course, maritime safety issues are addressed in international legal instruments, such as the International Convention for the Safety of Life at Sea, and the International Convention on Maritime Research Search and Rescue, and the US United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. And their implementation can help mitigate safety risks related to migration. Generally, all ships at sea are required to render assistance and rescue people in distress, so long as it not, does not endanger their own ship crew or passengers. Further compound, compounding the challenge, however, is that once people are at sea, their freedom is dependent on those in charge of the transit. Modern slavery is often called human trafficking or trafficking in persons. It refers to sex trafficking, indentured servitude, and forced labor, all of which also occur at sea. The sea can be used both as a means of transit as well as the means for captivity. 
Again, the conditions that people are subjected to change quickly, and one can shift from being a voluntary economic migrant to being a forced laborer once offshore without any means of seeking liberty. At sea, modern slavery and forced labor are most frequently identified in the fishing industry throughout the world. Instability ashore and instability at sea, as I mentioned earlier, are often in interconnected, and unsafe mixed migration and modern slavery will continue to be problems at sea. During maritime operations, navies need to be keenly aware of the connections between these issues and their connection with maritime security. Next, I would love to talk about the protection of cultural heritage, an important part of my office's current work. My office serves as the coordinator of cultural heritage protection issues within the Department of Defense, as well as DOD's coordinator with other U.S. departments and agencies that have responsibilities related to the protection of cultural heritage. For example, my office leads the DOD Cultural Heritage Protection Working Group. We also participate in Interagency Cultural Heritage Coordinating Committee, which is led by the Department of State. As Blue Shield describes, cultural heritage is the inheritance we've inherited. It comprised, it's comprised not only of tangible objects or monuments from the past, but also intangible aspects that are important to people, like customs, oral traditions, and rituals that are passed down to us over time. It is an important part of a people's identity, and therefore, in times, can become a flashpoint or a site of conflict, as people who are instigating violence use these meaningful sites and traditions to cause harm to populations that they're seeking to marginalize. Various issues can affect the protection of cultural heritage. Pollution and climate change can lead to architectural degradation. Theft of cultural property can be used to fund terrorism and organized crime and is used to fuel illicit antiquities markets. An armed conflict can cause major damage or destruction to cultural property and sites, along with potential persecution of individuals based on their cultural identification. During the campaign to defeat ISIS, Islamic State militants in Syria and Iraq earn between $150 and $200 million a year trading antiquities illegally. Interpol found that during the pandemic, cultural property-related crime not only continued, but in some places actually increased. In its 2020 Assessing Crimes Against Cultural Property survey, Interpol found that in 2020 alone, over 800,000 cultural property objects were seized worldwide. And according to World Heritage Statistics by UNESCO, out of 1,154 World Heritage properties, 52 are currently in danger. So as the data shows, the protection of cultural heritage continues to be a major and increasing challenge. Maritime cultural heritage is an important aspect that we, I know, will be discussing. It focuses on human interaction with coastal and maritime environments over time. And that includes tangible objects like shipwrecks and archaeological sites, along with intangible intang components like stories and oral histories. Like with land-based cultural heritage, complex issues can affect the protection of maritime cultural heritage, including degradation of coastal environments by pollution and climate change, excavation of maritime objects for sale on illicit antiquities markets, and the potential for the utilization of underwater archaeology to justify excessive maritime claims. Cultural heritage can be very important to individuals and community sense of identity, a source of knowledge and skills, and as the Blue Shield Network has noted, a powerful tool on determining what is remembered and what is forgotten or obscured over time. Cultural heritage awareness is of particular relevance for military forces, as they are often required to conduct military operations in culturally diverse environments. We need more dedicated effort in understanding all the ways we can better protect our cultural heritage on both land and at sea. As I mentioned earlier, the human security concept is being considered through a variety of paradigms routinely used to address how to improve protections for civilians in ground operations. And it's, it's time now that we can think more about the maritime environment as well. So I'll conclude my thoughts on where we can be thinking more boldly. First, in the Department of Defense, we have a joint force. I challenge you not only to explore these issues in the maritime environment, but to take what you learned today and think about how within your respective defense departments, you can start to confront these issues as joint problems across domains and with your civilian government agencies. Also, in the areas of unsafe mixed migration and modern slavery and cultural heritage protection, where we need to cooperate and coordinate with our allies and partners. 
as you'll see from the speakers today, different navies around the world are gaining valuable experience, and we can learn so much from each other. Take this opportunity to expand the network of experts that you think about and thinkers on these topics that you look to. Working together also means collaborating with other types of organizations, governments, industry, intergovernmental organizations, non-governmental organizations, and private groups all have a role to play. Militaries around the world need a more nuanced vision of what contributes to stability and to work creatively to achieve desired outcomes. If we do not act and think about human security at sea, we leave spaces for those who will seek to exploit the vulnerability of others, and we miss opportunities to interrogate the underlying landscape that fuels insecurity and contributes to the escalation of violence that we view as traditional threats to our security. From today and into the future, I challenge you to think more boldly about who else can contribute to solving these human security issues. Once again, I would love to thank you all for the great speakers and Andrea for putting this event together. Thank you to the Naval War College and to everyone from around the world who's engaged in exploring these important topics together. Thank you so much for your comments, Ms. Strzok. I'd like to take the opportunity to ask you a question, if I may. Sure. I'd like to ask, uh, how can focusing on maritime human security help the United States prevail against strategic competitors? One of the strengths of the United States is in our values of democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. And many of these programs and topics talked about at this conference on land and at sea are areas where we can share our values and work with our allies and partners. U.S. engagement can also build goodwill and help reduce the insecurities that competitors can exploit, just as you mentioned. And by reducing the chances of instability and conflict, we reduce the risk of the U.S. being inadvertently pulled into conflict with competitors. If we're not cooperating in maritime security areas, human security areas, there's two missed opportunities. First, we lose the chance to build on our values with our friends. This includes upholding international law and protecting people around the world. Second, we miss the opportunity to learn from others, since many navies are dealing with these issues regularly, and we understand that they have expertise that's very important to how we can collectively address them. We can collaborate more and enhance our alliances and partnership, and that values-based global engagement is strengthened when we engage in maritime human security issues around the world as a way to ensure that together we're able to prevail against strategic com competitors. Thank you so much. What a fantastic answer and a fantastic talk, completely appropriate for today. We really appreciate your time and your inspiring words that you have shared with us. Thank you, thank so, you much. so much. Thank you, Andrea. And thank you all to the organizers. And I hope that today is a, is a uh, riveting discussion. We really appreciate your insights uh, based on your background and your current role leading stability in humanitarian affairs. We've been honored that you have joined us today. Thank you. Well, now I would like to introduce our first panel for the day and our moderator. To follow up on Ms. Strzok's keynote message, we launched straight into a discussion on unsafe mis mixed migration and modern slavery. And the moderator is me. Um, I'm honored to moderate this panel as more and more of my own work in humanitarian and climate security seems to come back to this migration issue. Before I introduce our speakers, I wanted to provide some administrative guidance. All comments reflect the positions of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the official position of the U.S. Naval War College, the Department of the Navy, or the U.S. government. Please keep your microphones muted and your cameras off. Please post your questions and comments in the chat for the question and answer period after the presentations. And the biographies of all of our speakers are available in the conference program. There's a link to that in the chat. Now let's begin. Today's panel has two very distinguished speakers. First, I will introduce Dr. Ephthemios Papastravidis, a researcher and part-time lecturer at the, as the Faculty of Law of University of Oxford and Oxford Martin Fellow at the Oxford Martin School since two, April 2016. The postdoctoral researcher and teaching assistant in international law, Fellow of Law and Fellow, Athens, in Public International Law Center, National and Kapodistrian University of Athens. He was also a senior legal consultant for the UN Office on Drugs and Crime, who we saw present yesterday, 
and an expert legal consultant with the European Border and Coast Guard Agency with Frontex. He's consulted with the Hellenic Ministry of Foreign Affairs on issues of law of the sea. And he has, in 2012, he was appointed director of the Center for Studies of the Hague International, or Hague Academy of International Law. Thank you so much for joining us today. I look forward to hearing your thoughts on unsafe mixed migration and modern slavery at sea. Thank you so much, Andrea, and many, many warm thanks to the Naval War College uh, for this very kind invitation and honorable invitation. Um, I have um, uh, 50 minutes, I think, uh, so Andrea, just to, to follow up on, on, on the uh, very fascinating presentation and, and setting and the scene setting that was done by our keynote speaker, Ms. Strock. Um, we had the issue of positive uh, maritime migration, I think it's, it's, it's extremely important, extremely significant uh, from a practical, political, uh, operational, but also legal viewpoint. Uh, and me being a lawyer, I will try to actually highlight certain uh, legal uh, aspect of this, um, uh, this phenomenon. Uh, the situation is, is very dire, and the situation is not uh, only um, described as people smuggled or people, you know, crossing illegal borders, illegal borders in around the world, but also people missing, uh, people uh, found dead, people that they are haven't even found, that they have been declared missing, and the numbers are 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 uh, uh, illustrative. I mean, we have as far as as cross border. Um, Illegal, cross, illegal crossing, especially in the European uh, uh, context, we have now more than, in 2021, we had more than, uh, uh, in Eastern Mediterranean Sea, for example, we had more than 13,000, uh, 13, sorry, um, uh, 13,195 at the, the Frontex statistics uh, uh, in front of me. Uh, the Southern Mediterranean has been the most, um, uh, the most, uh, way or route that uh, and route that people are crossing through to go from Africa to go to, uh, to the Mediterranean Sea. And there are so many people they are missing. Right now, globally, according to the National Organization for Migration, we have uh, the numbers are, are, are shocking. We have uh, right now um, 4,000, almost 4,000 people they are, uh, uh, they are missing in 2021. Uh, they, since 2014, we have more than uh, 50 or almost 45,000 uh, uh, people dead crossing, uh, trying to cross uh, different countries, uh, land and especially sea. Uh, in particular, because we're, we're focusing on the Navy, the role of navies, uh, the lost people at sea, especially in the Central Mediterranean, in the Asian Mediterranean, but all the other places in, in, in uh, South America, in Asia, is, is, is shocking. And the issue is that this is, as has already been said, this is a problem. This is not only a search or rescue problem. It's not only rescuing lives at sea. It is a multifaceted problem. And the issue is that this, because we are talking about unsafe mixed migration. We are talking about people that they are leaving their countries for various reasons. And this boat people, if I may use this term of art, uh, they, the, they can fall under different categories. It is always, you know, we always have this, you know, the, the, this concept that these are either refugees or migrants, or we try to name them even before they leave their country and to get on a boat and try to come to, to Europe. It is not, there's not a certain legal category that we can, we can baptize them before they actually, or, or, or uh, classify them before they, before there is uh, actually um, uh, a ref, uh, status determination on land. Uh, in, in shortly, these people can be refugees, and refugee uh, in international law, there is a definition of refugees in international law in the 1951 uh, Geneva Convention, which uh, refugee has a very specific, uh, actually, definition. It's the people they are living, uh, uh, they are living a state, they are outside the borders of the state, they, and they are persecuted, they have fear, serious fear of being persecuted for certain reasons like uh, political opinion, being uh, by a member of a particular social group, uh, race, religion, right? Uh, and they don't want to afford the protection of their countries. These are very 
the very classic definition of refugee of our UN uh, convention uh, back in 1951. Now, in addition, there can be people that they call them asylum seekers, but asylum seekers that they are especially uh, the major problem with uh, Syrian refugees. The majority of people right now that we are perceiving them as refugees, they are not legally speaking refugees. Um, and I try to, 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 uh, to clarify this. They are persons in need of uh, complementary protection. If you are living a civil war, if you're fleeing from a civil war, typically you're not a refugee because back in 1951, the Refugee Convention was done for a different kind of reasons. It was done after the, the Holocaust was done with a specific you know, focus on the mind. However, these people do, uh, do deserve and are beneficiaries of supplementary or complementary protection. In the European Union, there is a certain regulation and directives on how to afford these people complementary protection. And I think also in the United States and other parts of the, parts of the world, there is the idea that we have statutory refugees and other people persons in need of protection. Also on the same boat, we can have potential victims of human trafficking. People that they will be trafficked to another state, and they will be, you know, they will be sexually exploited. They will be exploited to their domestic uh, servants. Um, and these people, in my humble view, they are also they could qualify as modern slaves. Now, legally speaking, slavery it is it has been defined back in 1926, uh, the Slavery Convention, and it, it needs a, a, a certain de jure, a very ownership, the element of ownership. I own someone which apparently does not exist in However, I just to, 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 to draw you your attention to a case, a case called uh, Mani Kurao in 2008, 2008, it was in, 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 um, uh, in the ECOWAS Court of Justice, uh, the Eastern Community, uh, uh, Community of Western African States Court of Justice, where this was a case against the Republic of Niger. There was a lady who was um, married uh, at the age of 12, she had she gave birth to five children. Her husband wanted to divorce her, and they signed they signed a, a, a liberation certificate. Um, the the father of of the of the woman, the husband, and the the tribe leader. A liberation a certificate of liberation. That is, you know, and I, I underline the word. And this is two thousand eight, not in 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 nineteenth century, right? So, all time. Slavery does exist, and new types of slavery do exist. We, we also, yesterday, we heard about the exploitation and human trafficking element in the fishing industry, right? And the people they are uh, working for without salaries or without remuneration, remuneration for uh, months at sea, right? So we have, along with uh, the, the asylum seeker, we have victims of human traffickers, victims of human trafficking, excuse me. We have people smuggled. We have also economic migrants. All these people are on the same boat. But all these people have different legal designations. And this legal designation and the protection they may afford or may not afford it. If you are just an economic migrant, of course, you can be expelled. You can be returned to your country, to the country you, you, you uh, originally started your journey. But this must be done after a refugee status determination, after there's a certain screening. And this is a, one first challenge for the navies is that you know, when you interdict people at sea, in order to be certain what is their legal designation, the proper way, and what this uh, also United Nations um, uh, High Commission for Refugees uh, advances, is that you get them on dry land. And then there's a screening process of, of what is this the legal you know, designation of these people and what are the, the, the protection that may be afforded and given. Also, we have smuggling of migrants. And smuggling of migrants, you know, uh, there is also a debate now in the European Union context with a new pact of, of, for migration and asylum. What is a smuggling of migrants? What is also a facilitation of entry in another country? The UN, um, um, the smuggling protocol of 2000, uh, annexed to uh, the 2000 UN um, uh, Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime, has a very specific definition. It, for a smuggling of migrants to exist as a crime, must be it is defined as the procurement in order to obtain directly a financial or other material benefit of the illegal entry of a person to a state. So you need to have an illegal entry and the procurement uh, uh, a financial uh, benefit. So this is of all these people, the majority of these people will be trafficked, will be sorry, will be smuggled. However, there is a crime, a criminal activity, very plain, which is the smuggling of migrants. 
on the other side, on the other hand, however, at the same time, there are people that they are the victims of this policy and they are in need of protection. So the navies right now have, first of all, to actually to try to protect the borders, to fight against mangrove migrants, and at the same time, at the same time, to protect life at sea. And this becomes even more, you know, uh, more challenging if because smuggling of migrants usually is conflated or usually in practice is, 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 is mixed with search and rescue situations. So usually the smugglers are using very unseaworthy uns boats to travel from, uh, let's say, from, um, uh, from Libya to, to Italy or from uh, Turkey to Greece or uh, from uh, West Africa to, to, um, uh, to Canary Islands. So these people were in need of, you know, probably they will, their life would be in danger and there would be a distress situation where which calls uh, upon the application of such a rescue regime. Now, in modern times, uh, all these law of the sea concepts like such a rescue, the, the idea of interdiction at sea where you can interdict, for example, in your community zone or in your territorial sea, is actually coupled with human rights and human rights protection, which is always a good thing, right? Human rights protection. However, it is very, I think, poses very um, important challenges to navies too. And we have very recent cases. In 2021, uh, the Human Rights Committee, the, um, uh, the, uh, the committee and the monitoring body of the International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights, which is a, a universal convention that applies also to the United States, applies all over the world, right? So it is not only a regional kind of uh, human rights convention. This, uh, this, uh, this committee uh, issued two decisions against Italy and against Malta with respect to the failure of both states. Actually, Italy was, was convicted for uh, the failure of these states to, to um, promptly uh, respond to a distress signal at sea in the central rescue zone uh, of Italy and Malta, because there's also an overlapping uh, of these two zones. Um, they were uh, Italy, Italian Navy was close by, not intervening in time. The, the committee finds that, you know, Italy and Malta, they are both responsible for the search and rescue zone. So whatever, whenever there's a distress signal in that area, you're automatically obligated under the, in the human rights law to actually do, what, to, to, to do whatever is, is possible to save these people's lives. And if you don't do this in, in time, in a timely fashion, in that particular case, there is the, the uh, the Human Rights Committee found a violation of the right to life of under Article 6 of the, uh, of the International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights. At the same time, we have a very interesting case in Greece, uh, against Greece, excuse me, uh, that is called the Pharmaconisi case, which is uh, under pending uh, before the European Court of Human Rights, which were actually Greek uh, a Coast Guard rescued these people and they were took back, they were taking them back to, uh, to, to, uh, to Athens, to Piraeus. However, the vessel capsized due to also to weather conditions, and there were some people, um, migrants were were uh, were found dead, were, were killed. So, and there is a case right now whether Greece um, has failed to to respect and ensure this right of life. So you see here you have you have a navy, you are navies or coastal navies and military navies, and and you want to protect the borders and do interdiction, try to fight smuggling migrants, but at the same time you have firstly to do such a rescue, and this is also maritime tradition, but now it, it is also, it, you may have also some human rights aspects, of course. And then, also under human rights law, uh, especially, you know, there have been many cases where there were, people were saved, or people, were, vessels were interdicted, and they were sent back to states like Libya, but they were, you know, they, they, they there was a serious risk of facing torture or other degrading and inhumane treatment. And this sending back uh, there were international uh, courts and tribunals that they found this as a violation of the prohibition, as we call it in, 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 in French, French um, uh, term is, is more, uh, it's, it's better known, it's the nor if we move. The idea that sent someone back in a place, in a country where it, he or she will face persecution and other torture or other degrading humane treatment. So at the same time, you have to grasp many challenges, right? And especially when it comes to my region, which is the Mediterranean Sea, and of course, as uh, Anmar Russo will, will probably discuss more later on this topic, there is a, a flurry of, of, first of all, legal regimes applicable, and a flurry of also of, of, of Navy operations that they are there. 
Um, as far as Navy operations right now, in, in the Mediterranean Sea, we have uh, Frontex, which is uh, the European Border and Coast Guard Agency, the responsible agency of the European Union. Uh, and there's Operation, let's say, Themis or Operation Poseidon in Greece, which is Themis in Central, um, Central Mediterranean Sea. There is, uh, um, uh, EU has a separate operation, another under a different uh, head, uh, hat, which is called Operation Irini, to fight smuggling of miners and weapons uh, smuggling from Libya. There's also, Italy has its own operation there. Um, and, you know, there is NATO, is, 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 uh, and, and we're also refer to this, is operating in, uh, off the coast of, or in the, in the Indian Sea, very close where I'm now, in Athens. So this is a, the multitude of navies out there. And these navies, however, they are, are subject to a multitude of laws, right? It's not only the law of the sea, it's not only the UN Security Council resolution that governs the activities under the, um, uh, under the EU operation uh, IRINI, but it's also many human rights treaties. And I'm, because we're talking about human security, I think it's important, important to, to draw the attention and underline these human rights treaties. There is the European Convention of Human Rights with, with 48, 47 member states. The International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the the EU Charter for Fundamental, Fundamental Rights, so which is actually um, uh, this charter is, is applicable to uh, EU operations and EU many member states are applying EU law. There's a Convention Against Torture. All these are actually binding states, and we have this you know this very uh, very very interesting matrix of rules that they are. You know they're applicable uh, at sea, and it's it's really difficult to uh, it's it's a very difficult role for, for navies to to uphold. Um, at one on the one hand you have to protect the borders, on the other hand you have to protect the rule of law, which is challenging. And the challenge, and I will close with this, is is of course the idea that you know uh, we have to have a legal basis, of course, to interdict people at sea, right? Uh, to stop the vessel ladder or UN Security Council resolution. Or the consent of the flag state, or a uh, or a vessel of nationality uh, under the law of this convention. But on the other hand, you have to actually, at the same time, to know that there is the right of life applicable. There is the obligation not to send someone back where he or she will face persecution. The idea that you have to bring the person on shore in order to identify what is its legal category where it falls. Right. All this is 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 really uh, it's for us lawyers and academics. It's it's very you know, interesting because it's very, we can write books and articles on this, but of people that they are out there and you're out there, it's, it's, I think it's like a, like, it seems like a nightmare. Anyways, I don't want to end with a, bad, with a, a negative note, uh, but uh, I'm looking forward to the discussion later on and, and thanks again for the very, very honorous and, uh, uh, and kind invitation, thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Papastravidis. We truly appreciate how you framed up this issue of unsafe mixed migration and modern slavery, and particularly your legal context and the construct and putting it so deeply into the maritime environment. So to build off of this part of the discussion, I would like to introduce our second panelist, Rear Admiral Stefano Russo. Rear Admiral Russo joined the Italian Navy attending the Naval Academy from 1987 to 1991 and he graduated in Naval and Maritime Science at Pisa University. He, he served on board submarines between 1992 and 2005 as Navigator, Operations Officer, Executive Officer, and Commanding Officer, taking part in several national and NATO missions in the Mediterranean, and getting relevant experience regarding the pattern of life in illegal trafficking. In his career, he commanded the logistic ship Brandano, the Soro class submarine Salvatore Pelosi, and the submarine group and the submarine Flotilla. Ashore, he was also director of the submarine training center, bringing in charge or being in charge of several international cooperation programs in the submarine branch, and chief of staff of submarine command in Rome, managing submarine command and control. Currently, he is commander of Standing NATO Maritime Group Two operating in the Mediterranean and Black Sea. In addition to the decorations for an officer of his rank and seniority, he has been awarded with medals for participation in Operation Active Endeavor against terrorist activity in the Mediterranean. Rear Admiral Russo, 
We are honored to have you join with us today to talk to us about NATO operations. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much for your kind uh, presentation. I'm uh, very pleased and honored uh, for to, 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 uh, to talk to this uh, qualified uh, audience, uh, uh, although in a virtual uh, in a virtual way. I follow the the other uh, presentation and uh, with a careful interest. Uh, if you don't mind, I pass to uh, uh, modality uh, slide modality in order to to. Uh, facilitate to follow me uh, in my speech. The reference uh, of uh, the NATO agenda C activity uh, are uh, the Secure Strategic uh, Directive 003 and uh, Allied uh, Maritime Command Operational Guidance uh, number one, two, and three. To start my presentation, I'd like to show you a slide with the uh, irregular migratory flows in the Mediterranean. You can see two main roads from North Africa to Italy and Spain, and an Eastern Mediterranean route through Turkey to Greece. Consider that when migrants arrive in one of these mentioned countries, they enter in, Europe, in a European Union and Schengen Treaty areas, where there are not barriers and controls among member states, and they are very, or, or they are very limited. Therefore, if uh, they get asylum, can move everywhere, or as a irregular, it is easier to move in. I will focus my presentation on the Eastern Mediterranean route, characterized by irregular migrants coming principally from Syria and Afghanistan, and consequently on NATO Aegean Sea activity. The Aegean Sea activity was born in February 2016 in connection with the escalation of the Syrian crisis. On the request of Greece, Turkey, and it is self-evident for their geographical position, and Germany as well, being mostly affected by arrivals through the Balkans. It's also important to know that there is an agreement between the uh, European Union and Turkey, providing that Turkey receive economic aids from the Euro Euro European Union in order to manage migrants on its territory. And in case of a, in, in, an intercepted sea, uh, the migrant must be handed over to Turkish authorities. In this slide, on the left side, you can see how close are the maritime borders from the two countries, and consequently, uh, how it's difficult to control them. The geopolitical situation is furthermore made complicated by the presence of disputes over the Aegean island. But why maritime? Why, why a NATO maritime operation? Of course, the European Union was the first actor interested in uh, solving migrant issues. But considering uh, Turkey's involvement uh, out of Europe, uh, it was a necessary proposal mission under NATO flag uh, as the opportunity to match all involved actors. Therefore, NATO decided to join international efforts in dealing uh, with this uh, humanitarian crisis uh, with security and safety implications. The activity is, per, is performed together with other agency and uh, Coast Guard in four focus area that you can see on the right side uh, of, uh, of the slide. Uh, four uh, uh, patrol areas, uh, Papa 1, Papa 2, Papa 3, and Papa 4, using part of the standing maritime uh, NATO group uh, assets that operate in, uh, especially in Papa 1 and Papa 2 sectors. SNMG2 is a high readiness group of a light ship that operate, that operate in the Mediterranean and Black Sea. Reinforced for this specific operation by additional ships, the task unit 01 that you see on the left, on the left side, currently composed by uh, a German flagship, three uh, Greek uh, ships, and one Turkish ship. Okay, in order to uh, accomplish this task, SNMG2, and specifically the task unit 01, has to conduct reconnaissance, monitoring, and surveillance of illegal crossing in support of Turkish and Greek Coast Guard and authorities such as Frontex, the European border, border and Coast Guard Agency, ensuring a permanent presence of at least units on task, two units on task. Therefore, NATO ship co complement uh, 
the Coast Guard of uh, Turkish of, of Turkey and Greece, as well as Frontex vessel. They are larger ships than Frontex vessels and they have a very modern system for surveillance. They can also operate even under unfavorable conditions and the sensor and radars have a broader reach. The second task is uh, identify, track, investigate and report anomalies, which may suggest activities that could be uh, related to terrorism or to illegal migrants trafficking. So NATO task is not to stop or push back the migrant boats, but to help the allies, European Union, European Union and agency in their efforts to cut the phenomenon. The key to the success of the operation is close cooperation with all stakeholders in the area. The CTU-01 has not a direct link uh, with external agency, but it is in touch through the Greek and Turkish license officers embarked on board the German frigate. Therefore, they pass any migrants related information to their national authorities following their specific agreements. First months, uh, create a good cooperation was not easy and smooth, but the use of uh, a super party success, such as Germany, overall has promoted a good and fruitful cooperation, despite some occasional frictions. The other task is related to SAR operations. So in, ca in case of SAR operation, establish communication with the regional coordinator center responsible for search and rescue. So in accordance with international law, all ships that sail, including NATO ships, have to rescue people in distress at sea. Nevertheless, in case of uh, search and rescue operations, allied vessels will live up to their national responsibility. I mean, chop out, to manage better legal issues connected to the presence of migrants on board. Let's talk about uh, the results, mission, mission accomplishment. In this slide, uh, you can see uh, uh, the attempts uh, in total between uh, 2007, to 2017, and 2021, with a peak uh, in uh, 2019, uh, about uh, 50,000 uh, people. Uh, in coincidence uh, uh, with uh, uh, when Turkey opened their borders. Then, then you can see that uh, the phenomenon uh, decreased, uh, especially uh, during uh, the, the pandemic. But lastly, we are noticing, uh, a, a, again, an increasing of the phenomenon, in part, in part connected to Afghan crisis, but not like uh, the pre-COVID uh, pre period. In this slide, uh, you can see the success rate, uh, the success, I mean uh, the, the success rate to, to reach uh, uh, Greek Island. Picture show uh, uh, the success rate as part of the total numbers of attempts. And uh, you can see that uh, the success rate in uh, Papa 2 is uh, significantly lower than uh, the rates in other areas. The reason may, might be that presence of the flagship of uh, SNMG2 uh, Task Unit 01 is uh, disproportionately higher compared with the other areas. In slide number 10, you can see uh, that, that people and miss people from uh, 2017 in the Mediterranean with significantly less debt and missing compared to other areas in East Med. In this slide, you can see dead and miss, missing people by year. As, as, as you can see in uh, uh, the, the, the situation from uh, 2015, uh, when uh, the, uh, and better from 2016, when the operation started, uh, generally decreased uh, up to uh, the uh, present, the current value of 19 people up to now. A 
about uh, the results, we can say overall that uh, illegal migration phenomenon is drastically reduced, contributing in human security. That's uh, at sea is reduced, contributing in, in human safety. To conclude my brief, NATO, NATO's task is not to stop or push back migrant spots, but cooperate with all the regional actors, stakeholders, and allies in order to reduce migrant phenomenon in agency. NATO operation in agency is uh, effective, reducing arrivals, missing people, and death at sea. Constantly professional cooperation between all partners is the key to the, to the success. The agency activity is complementary to you know, European Union agency and Coast Guard. We have a great surveil surveillance capacity from NATO ship versus small uh, patrol boat versatility. I mean, uh, uh, Frontex and Coast Guards. But finally, it's self-evident that maritime control and maritime domain are only the tip of the iceberg as a consequence of a process that must that must take place on land. Let's conclude uh, my brief uh, uh, pending, uh, pending your question. For Admiral Russo, thank you for that fantastic brief. I would like to ask you the first question. You mentioned right towards the end how you were working with other uh, allies and stakeholders, the EU and Frontex. I was wondering if you could kind of describe to us how you collaborate with them operationally. Yeah, it, uh, on, a, on a German uh, flagship, uh, so the CTU under my, my command, uh, there are two, uh, two officers, uh, two license officers, a Greek, a Greek uh, officer and a Turkish uh, officer. Uh, so uh, the, the, German, uh, Ger the German captain, when uh, uh, sea at sea, some uh, migrant boat, uh, don't, uh, don't uh, uh, signal it uh, directly to uh, Coast Guard, but it do it, he, he do it, he does it uh, through uh, the license officer. The license officer uh, are, 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 uh, are, are connected to their uh, national authorities. I mean, uh, the, the, the Greek with the Greek authorities, the Turkish with the, uh, the, the Turkish authorities. And so it's easy to manage uh, uh, the situation according to the specific uh, uh, national rules. Thank you. For Dr. Papastravidis, I invite both of you to keep your cameras on for the question and answer period. Also, uh, I really like the pairing of both of you because I think it, it flowed naturally from one to the other because you have so much, uh, you know, you're looking at the same space. Uh, for Dr. Papastravidis, I'd love to hear your thoughts on kind of the, the operational perspective that Dr. Riyamo Russo proposed and what perhaps you thought, whether you saw it in the same kind of mission accomplishment or maybe beyond what he said, which basically says it comes back to problems on land. But what more, in your opinion, could we be doing as we look at the whole route of unsafe mixed migration? Many thanks, Andrea. And you can call me Akis, I think it's more handy than my very big Greek name, uh, surname actually, and the first name, so Akis, it's just fine. Um, so uh, I really, I really like, and uh, I thank very much to uh, Admiral Russo for, for, his, uh, for his speech, and I think it was a very fair and a very, you know, reflects the situation in the, in, in, in the GNC. The, uh, let me put it this way, the problem, however, is not solved, and, and, and Admiral Russo did say it. so. Uh, migration at sea is like a has this kind of waterbed uh, situation. It's just you close one part of the of, of the migration route and another part opens up. So uh, the Eastern Mediterranean Sea uh, route is, is seems closed. Uh, however, we have illegal border crossing from other places. Um, 
uh, again in 2008 or 9 the, mo the, the most problematic area was western uh, western um, africa and the canary islands then it was frontex operated there it was closed it went to the central Mediterranean sea then it went to uh, in 2015-16 went to, to the gnc and then now again the problem is, is is located back to the central Mediterranean sea so you see there's always and the smugglers are always uh, uh, you know before us so they always find the routes and uh, you know that they are they can they can smuggle people before actually before actually the frontex or other agencies or nato and you and others you know um, organization try to uh, to to address the problem so i think it's it's the, the solution it's of course it can be not it's not only at sea but mostly on land uh, as also the legal things on land so um when it comes to uh for example as uh, the prosecution of smuggling of migrants. I have a, it was very recently, was a, 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 a read a case, a national case in, in Greece, where there was, a, for example, there was a, a vessel uh, that was rescued uh, off Crete um, and uh, on the high seas. It was 400 people that were smuggled, a big number, right? So there were like four people that they were, four or five people they were accused of trafficking, of smuggling of migrants. They went, they were, they were, Caught, they were. They went to Greece. They were put on trial. In the first instance, uh, uh, you know, it fined them, it imprisoned them for many years because it was an aggregate crime for the four hundred people they have actually smuggled. And there was also the risk of life. So there were also uh, there was the, the crime of, of putting people in, in danger. Actually, however, when it went to the uh, to the uh, court of appeal, the court of appeal. Um, State proceedings and said no. There's no. Uh, the case should not be continued. That people are free. Why? Because Greece did not have actually um, used the mechanism of the smuggle of migrants protocol to to prescribe legislation to legislate in order to actually prosecute persons that they are found on the high seas on board of a foreign flag vessel. I forgot to tell you that the vessel was from Kiribati Islands. So Kiribati Island was the, the flag state. So Greek court said, okay, um, you have to, to be prosecuted by whom? By Kiribati. I hardly doubt that Kiribati will prosecute these persons that were smuggling migrants in the Indian Sea. So you see there's like a, uh, there's not only having great Navy power and we really thank uh, uh, NATO and what have done in the Indian Sea, but also have laws in place in domestically, have cooperation, have, take preventive measures, have a very good risk analysis of the future migration routes. And of course, I mean, you know, in a very utopian world, it would be great not to have people that they will need protection, right? People that they will never flee from their camps. This is ideal. However, this is not very realistic, pragmatic for the time being. However, as I tell you, uh, and I will stop with this, it's, it's a very, very difficult problem. And especially from leg legally speaking, it's very complicated. Thanks. Thank you very much. Ramro Russo, I'd like to ask you a question. You described uh, what I would consider a, a huge operational success in how you were saving lives in your area of responsibility. I was wondering in general, uh, to me, NATO treats this as an operational problem. Do you think they have a strategic vision on how to do migrant operations in the future? Oh, uh, it's a uh, it's very difficult to answer this uh, this question. Uh, of course, uh, uh, the NGRC activity we we uh, we, we saw that uh, it's uh, an effective operation, but there are not other uh, NATO operations uh, in uh, in the world. So, uh, speak about uh, a strategic uh, vision overall uh, is a big deal. Is a big deal in my in my opinion, but uh, uh, it's 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 a good good example how uh, a great community as NATO uh, can co can or must cooperate to solve uh, to solve a big problem that involve uh, uh, countries that uh, uh, belong to the same uh, to the same organization, but uh, maybe different interests. I don't know if uh, I answered your uh, your question. Thank you for that answer. Um, Akis, did you have a thought on that as well? To 
term you mentioned. Um, I think NATO's role was was very welcome, especially the period, because it is uh, due to the tension between Greece and Turkey. NATO was like a as like the intermediary, right? So it was uh, there and the, and the cooperation that uh, uh, Admiral Russo um, uh, described of the Greek Turkish, you know, counterparts and uh, in NATO was was very welcoming of the period. Uh, as I told you, I think that this is uh, a very interesting. And this is happening right now in Europe uh, to a certain extent. The other organization I was consulted, Frontex, um, and other agencies, they are moving to what we call multi dimensional operations. So, Frontex initially was only uh, responsible, competent to fight a uh, smuggle of migrants. Uh, and uh, now, in the new iteration of the regulation, Frontex regulation, there is, it, it can actually tackle every transnational organized crime from drug trafficking, smuggling of migrants, um, uh, terrorism, weapons, smuggling, and all, all, all everything under the sun. The same seems to apply in the other EU operations. I recently heard that the EU operation of Alada, of Somalia, now has also a mandate not only to, to uh, monitor illegal fishing, but also monitor drug trafficking. So I think that, you know, cooperation with cooperation, either agency cooperation, cooperation, NATO, Frontex, or other, you know, um, uh, naval operations, but also a uh, uh, multi hat uh, operations, multi faceted operation, I think is, is, is the future of, of in, in, in uh, maritime law enforcement. And, but again, I need to stress that this is uh, maybe a nightmare for lawyers because it's a different legal basis if you want to, uh, to interdict a drug trafficking vessel, a different legal basis when you do fisheries inspection, a different legal basis when you do counter drug, uh, you know, smuggling, counter smuggling migrants operation. So this is, is, is something which is, you know, it, it becomes uh, uh, a very good work for us and for law, uh, Navy lawyers or, or Coast Guard lawyers, uh, but I think it's, it's also very challenging you know, operationally for people on, uh, at sea. Thank you. Admiral, you mentioned that your previous experience, you, you worked on terrorism missions and other types of activities in the maritime environment. What we've heard from a lot of our panelists throughout our event is, is there's, you know, these water routes, these maritime channels are being used for a variety of different activities uh, on the sea. Could you talk to how you have had migration kind of overlap with other kind of illegal activities? Yeah, uh, of course, my perspective is uh, uh, the perspective of a submariner, a submariner. Uh, so, uh, when, when you know a submariner, a, a, the submarine can can be used to uh, uh, inter collection, uh, to monitor, to surveillance, and uh, and uh, the, the, their uh, their uh, availability is uh, to uh, to see uh, something uh, without uh, modifying the behavior of uh, who. Uh, who make uh, uh, illegal activities? Uh, so, in my uh, in my experience, uh, I uh, uh, I face uh, sometimes uh, uh, some uh, some uh, migrants uh, carried by uh, mother ships, and uh, that uh, uh, thinking not to be uh, not to be seen at certain time uh, cut cut the, the cables and, uh, and leave these migrants alone at sea with just uh, a telephone. Uh, this is my experience in uh, Central Mediterranean. Uh, of course, of, of course, this, uh, this, uh, uh, this behavior, this behavior uh, was, uh, was uh, illegal. Uh, but the presence of the summary in that in that in that case uh, uh, was good to uh, to uh, to make uh, uh, make uh, uh, come a, a surface ship that uh, with the boarding team arrest the the, the, the smugglers. Uh, this is an example uh, <laughs> of uh, uh, life at sea. That I uh, experience uh, on uh, on my summaries. Thank you. I have a question for both of you. 
from a, one of our panel or one of our participants today. Um, given the current situations on land and protect projected trends in climate, is there the potential that we'll kind of get into locked into a waterbed effect, moving from one operation to another to another? And that at some point countries might decide that the cost of naval operations may not be worth it to continue in this space. Akis, could you start? And then I'll give the Admiral a chance. Uh, thank you. Thank you. That's an excellent question. Um, and, you know, this is, I, I'm not very positive that migration will very, will, you know, the problem of the refugee crisis or migration crisis, whatever we name it, it is, will be. It is a matter of a few years to stop. And we have now with the climate change, which is another topic of, of importance. Uh, we have a potential refugee, um, uh, environmental refugees, as they usually they are called, right? So people that are living from states that will be, uh, you know, uh, islands that will be under the, the, the high tide very soon, right? Um, so it's, it's a huge issue, and probably navies and the cost of having all these. You know, uh, all these uh, Navy assets and aerial assets at, at, at sea, it is very, you know, uh, it is really something which we have to take uh, into account. What well, seems to be the future, and also in, in, in other respects, is use and uh, admirers, of course, more uh, handy to discuss about this use modern technologies, use satellites or drones to monitor, survey vast uh, ocean areas. And you know, and you can say, and not only vast ocean areas, but to, you can be able to track people. That they are living, for example, at, you know, the, at, at you know they are at sort of live and they're ready to live. I mean, you can know you have a better maritime domain awareness, better idea, better you know vision of what's what's going on, and also what is happening. And you know, at, at a point, this is for especially people that are um, human rights activists. This is an anathema. Is the idea uh, that you know this kind uh, this idea of pull, not uh, pushbacks, but pullbacks in the, in the sense of contactless uh, you know, control, in the sense that you can use assets and cooperate with states of transit, like Libya or like we was having with Turkey and other states, and to, to stop migration before these people are leaving their shores, which raises a host of international legal questions of, uh, and human rights issues. Uh, but this is occurring. The European Union also have made certain agreements with uh, sub-Saharan African countries. Um, Partisan agreement saying to them, please do not leave, let people living live from your state, and I will fund, I will give you know funding to your state. So I think the, the, the future is, is, is try to try to solve problems on state of origin and state of transit, special state of origin, and also trying to find um, very viable um, legal migration routes. So visas, for example, if someone is really uh, an asylum seeker, you can take a visa from a certain state and can fly safely in, in the state that it will be uh, appointed to be the state that will host and protect him or her. So I think we have to think out of the box and to be able to address all this issue because, uh, you know, uh, we cannot either have all the Navy of the world in, in our, for example, in our NATO all the time to be the GNC or spend so much money or be, you know, look at numbers of thousands of people dying every day at sea. So this is, you know, something which is, it needs to be a very comprehensive solution to the problem. Thanks. Thank you, Akis. Admiral, do you have any thoughts on whether countries might decide that the cost of naval operations might not be worth it? Uh, I think that the, the refugee problem uh, is, uh, is, going, is, is going the worst. So uh, I don't believe that the nations can uh, consider to, to stop uh, uh, maritime activities that, as I mentioned before, uh, are not the solution, but one of the solutions. Uh, of course, uh, uh, also uh, tactical procedures uh, must improve because uh, sometimes refugees uh, uh, use a smartphone uh, to, to, to localize uh, IS uh, uh, from, uh, from the ships. Uh, and so uh, uh, they change the course, they, they change uh, their routes. So uh, also the tactics uh, must change and uh, the, the, the equipment uh, must improve. Uh, I uh, heard about uh, uh, drones uh, uh, and 
it, it could be it could be a, a good solution. But I definitely think that uh, uh, nations uh, don't stop uh, don't stop uh, these uh, these activities. They can't they can't stop. Thank you so much for that answer. I'd like to you you both kind of are are alluding to what the future might look like. Uh, so I'd like to get a sense of kind of how you do your maritime domain awareness right now. Um, and it seems mostly in a response mode, how you might monitor in the future. And then taking that a step further, if you kind of could dream about how we could do this better in the maritime environment, what would that look like? Uh, Admiral, would you like to start? Yes, I, as I mentioned before, we, we need uh, uh, more, uh, more uh, improved equipment. Uh, it's good. It's good to have a, a good cooperation with all agency. It means that we have a clear picture of what happened uh, at sea. Uh, submarines can can be used to uh, intercept uh, uh, the ships, uh, the mother ships, uh, rather than uh, uh, the boats that don't uh, don't uh, spoke IS, for example. Uh, but also drones, uh, air assets, uh, all uh, all can uh, can uh, be be uh, uh, useful to accomplish uh, accomplish this uh, this mission. Um, it, we need a a, a a good a good network from uh, all uh, agency from all countries, and uh, there are good examples about it. We are not. Uh, 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 behind on this on this uh, on this issue can you describe the command and control that is used uh, amongst nato ships and other partnerships uh, in the maritime environment yeah it, uh, uh, principally well, we have the operational center the, there are the fusion of uh, all of the uh, information that arrive uh, from the sea from the air uh, from uh, from the naval assets uh, uh, from the submarine, from uh, the, the equipment uh, ashore. Uh, this fusion center uh, often connected to, uh, to uh, um, uh, agency, uh, civilian agency, uh, are the key to, 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 to reach the result. And uh, they are, from in my experience, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in NATO, in NATO environment, but also in a uh, my country environment uh, in uh, Italian sink fleet, uh, they are very effective. Excellent. Akis, would you like to answer my previous question? Yes, uh, thank you, Andrea. Uh, I mean, it's uh, as I described uh, as a, you know, um, implicated in it before, I think there is, you know, technology could be a key. It won't be the solution, but it will be a key to, to ameliorate the situation and, and facilitate maritime domain awareness. I'm actually at the at Oxford, I'm working on a project of how you can use satellites and satellite evidence to, to actually um, uh, to curb uh, illegal uh, unregulated and report fishing and uh, also to uh, protect marine biodiversity. It is true we have, uh, we have done research on this and uh, satellites may use, may be used, and they are used, um, uh, especially with when you can corroborate and correlate the evidence with uh, IS or VMS uh, data, and can be helpful uh, not only to monitor marine protected areas, uh, areas that they are you know far out in the middle of the ocean, but also can you know if it correlates with other evidence, you can have uh, you know you can be helpful uh, before a court of law. Nevertheless, uh, so far, uh, the, what is the, the outcome of our research? And this creatures, of course, which can, of course, can can be um, uh, you know exported also to other uh, domains like maritime smuggling of migrants. This is not enough. Uh, so I will get, I will very much um, uh, agree with with uh, with the other rules. So that you know, navies are still important, and they will be important. Uh, assets at sea. It's important. You may have, you know, you may have the diligence by a satellite, by a drone, but you need an asset to actually arrest the people or save the people or do whatever you know uh, it is. It's required. And saying about saving the people uh, nowadays, I mean, you can use also technology to be able to see uh, whether there are vessels that they are in distress on sea to corroborate whether 
truly there's a vessel that is in distress or someone is just you know is is is, is playing with you right so um uh, these satellites and drones whenever wherever they are applicable and they are uh, they could be of extreme uh, uh, you know a use and for for navies and, and states thanks Well, this concludes our panel for today. I'd like to thank so much Akis and the Admiral for joining us. Fantastic naval focus on this very important issue. We will take our first break. Please join us at 1010 for our final panel on cultural heritage protection in the maritime environment, moderated by Dr. Chris Jasparo. Thank you to the Admiral and thank you, Akis. We appreciate your time. <laughs>